So anyway, thank you everyone for coming. I'm Thomas Hare. I'm the Chief Content Officer of the PDMI. We are here for our fifth and final session of the day, which means it's our fifth council session, our Brand Response Council, which Chris Foster is our chair. Um, Chris also uh, pretty much owns and operates our Take 20 webinar series, which airs every other Wednesday um, at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 o'clock Pacific. This is essentially this week's a day early and it's 40 minutes longer. Take 20 is a 20 minute webinar series where we talk about the hottest topics in the uh, business and it's, it's become kind of a, uh, it's very popular among our members, I will say. It's become a very popular uh, bi-weekly or bi-monthly event for our members. So thank you, Chris. Um, we want to say thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Thank you to the hotel for hosting us. Most importantly, at the educational sessions, we thank the educational session sponsor, and that is Pacific Media Technologies. PMT has a video for you, and they're going to play it right now. I started PMT to apply the principles that I learned in the live television business to the DR delivery business. What makes PMT different is our people and their dedication to this industry. Quality is the key to what we do. And as the DR business changes, we'll be changing with it and we'll be ahead of the game. Pacific Media Technologies, technology driven, quality guaranteed. So once again, thank you to PMT for your support. The Brand Response Council put together this great session, Redefining Shoppable TV. Um, title changed last week, which was cool. Um, but we've got it right here. Um, and our wonderful uh, panel, Jack Barrett, Urban Legend Productions, Megan Glenn from Flow Code. You can get all of their bios by going outside and clicking the flow code on the banner or in your program, and uh, all their bios are in there. And of course, uh, Tom Wolf from Viant. We're really excited to have all three of you here, as well as you, Chris. Take it away. So, so this actually was a comment um, that Tom made at the very beginning of our discussion. He said, there's this mythical promise of buying Jennifer Aniston's sweater when you saw it on Friends, and you had a remote, and you could click, and you could buy it. That was then, but now there's actual device to digital audience interactivity, and we've seen it in the recent NCAA tournament. We're gonna to show an example. So shoppable TV has kind of been this golden promise for direct-to-consumer advertisers. Just never yet fulfilled, right? And there's some false starts and questions about devices, and it's an uncertain landscape, but now that's changing with newer and more integrative technologies and a better understanding of how to manipulate and edit cross-creative you know, cross-device creative, right? How do you adjust the creative in, in its platforms? So we thought that now would be a good time to help us redefine shoppable TV for 2023 and beyond. So in this session today, we're gonna talk about strategies, platform, activation, and creative best practices that reveal what's happening now, the potential that can be for the future, and also how to avoid some of the pitfalls in the past. So we're gonna kind of get started and, and move in, and, and Tom, we're gonna start with you and kind of talk about that insight you have about, you know, the challenge with user interaction and that mythical promise of buying Jennifer Aniston's sweater. I, I, saw it was, I thought that was so insightful. So could you elaborate on that? Thinking about this today, thank you. The, uh, the, whoever came up with that phrase probably did a huge disservice to the business accidentally. Right, because the, th the thought that you could buy Jennifer Aniston's sweater um, not only doesn't quite accurately reflect the content experience, but it doesn't quite accurately reflect the commerce experience either. Right? So the content experience, the, the way that we've looked at it, um, both at Viant, but in my past positions too in, in the TV world, is there's a, there's a content a consumption experience and then there's, a, then there's the commerce consumption experience. Um, I, when I worked at Comcast, we always had challenges figuring out how do we p pull people out of a program to shop, right? They're there for a certain reason, and this was particularly challenging in the days when everybody was viewing linear only. So we were talking about in the context of what could you do when video on demand comes around and people can actually pause. You can pull them out into these other video on demand experiences. But there's a whole set of challenges that come with that. For the most part, streaming TV has helped solve a lot of those, right? You can pause whenever you want. You can do things on the side of the screen. The rights now allow you to do it that they didn't before. Uh, but it's still a user, the, the user experience on TV has always been about leaning back 
and absorbing the programming that's coming at you, and it's been very good for high-level branding historically. But so challenge one is figuring out how do you make this work when that's the TV consumption experience. The second challenge is around the commerce consumption experience. And this is where the Jennifer Aniston sweater thing comes in. What do you do when you buy a sweater? You, you touch it. You look at the size. You look at the, you feel it. What's it feel like? You try it on. Now, you, you can't do that on TV, right? So you have to think about what are the appropriate kinds of products that would sell on TV. The performance marketing industry has always done a very good job of selling things on television, right? And so now we're really just talking about how do you make it happen in real time and attribute it. But back then, you couldn't necessarily do that with these sorts of things, you know, advanced products and this promise of the, the sweater. So um, you have the commerce consumption experience, and marrying those two things is quite difficult. And then on top of that, at least in the traditional TV world, you had the fulfillment exercise. Who's going to fulfill it? Who's going to order the sweater? Who's gonna, how are you going to pay for it? Do you have to enter a credit card number on your television screen? And we saw all sorts of things, uh, you know, let's get a keyboard for the TV, let's have them write it on the back of their remote or whatever, right? And it just didn't work. Right. So the historical piece of that is, is, is you know, how can we make this thing work? Um, with the advent of streaming TV, we have seen all sorts of things happen. Um, and I think the most memorable one is probably that QR code that bounced around the screen at the Super Bowl last year. That's right. Because it truly married and, and uh, the experience that people now have on their TV, which is to lean back and enjoy the program, but engage on the device in their hand when they see something interesting. And that's why we have to redefine T-commerce, right? right. It, it's not just one device anymore. It's what is that user doing across multiple devices. Right, and that's a perfect lead into Megan and Flowcode talking about that QR code. And I'll show an example in a little bit, but not just the Super Bowl, but I'm seeing them in a lot of yeah. programming now. Can yeah. you speak to that? Absolutely, and how spoiled am I with a lead in like that? I feel like that was the perfect setup. But that's why I'm here. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> love it for us. Um, I mean, here's the thing about shoppable TV you know, we kind of have this in our heads of the iterations that it's taken so far, right? Whether it's hitting a button on a remote, and I don't know about you guys, I don't know the last time I had my remote in my hand. Um, you know, so there's things that we kind of have developed, and to your point, haven't, haven't taken off, and you, you definitely see kind of these, these various technologies popping up, and um, I'm really spoiled in that I work for a technology company that, that virtually is, is just truly omnichannel. And so what we're seeing with these incredible, you know, TV, just isolating our TV partners specifically, is creating shoppable moments across every type of TV content, right? And so you imagine uh, Flowcode is the jumping off point for that e-commerce experience, and it can be in spot TV, it can be in a live broadcast that has, you know, a back and forth live e-commerce uh, component to it, and, and you also see, um, shopping segments and syndicated programming. You know, it's virtually just leaning into the idea that consumers know how to use this technology. They're very likely to be expecting a second screen experience. And, you know, the, the really smart thing about it is we talk about disruption without detracting from the experience. And the thing about flow code and this shoppable TV opportunity is that rather than kind of pulling away from the content or creating an alternate experience to that original TV programming. It's actually kind of bringing that user into that second screen so that they can still partake and, and have that, that kind of uh, super intentional action, bringing them directly to that point of purchase. Um, and so, you know, to your point about, you know, buying Jennifer Aniston's sweater, the, the infrastructure hasn't always been there in the past. It's kind of been a clunky experience, but you know we're we're getting to the point that it's that it's possible, and we see partners doing it all the time. Yeah, we're getting closer. And um, in the one of the sessions earlier today, Andy Latimer from Blue Water was talking about the funnel, and how you create kind of the job of each step of that funnel. And and Megan, you talked about that second screen experience, which mm -hmm. kind of leads us Jack to that creative strategy, right? Mm -hmm. How do I plan the approach? for knowing that there's a second, perhaps third screen experience and perhaps a website experience that flows a user through. Right, yeah, and that's something that uh, kind of falls on us as creatives to make sure we're keeping in the forefront of our mind as we're developing creative. 
And I think um, one of the things we, we, we want to make sure to do that we remind ourselves is to build on that equity from those different screens, those different branding moments. So not make, in the past, I think you've seen cases where there might be a streaming or a linear ad that takes you to a website. It doesn't look anything like the ad. You're not even sure you went to the right place. So um, creatively, we're thinking about the equity that got built up to getting the, view, the consumer to that point. So brand identity, brand integrity, and uh, a creative approach that complements all of those you know, different screens. Because the screens are different. You could have a 16, a 15, a 30 second, or as one of the gentlemen asked uh, Andy, that 10 second ad um, on the daytime TV, right? And right. how you adjust the creative for those things. Yeah, you adjust the screen, but the, I think the, the, then also what you keep in mind is what doesn't change, what motivates people. You know, tangible human experiences translate a lot of those different formats and channels, right. tangible human experiences, making sure we're uh, using uh, strategies uh, that, that are appropriate for each of those channels, but the strategies sort of remain the same. That is, what is the product or service? Why do they need it? And where do I get it? Mm -hmm. and, the flow, and flow code is a great way to solve the where do I get it mm -hmm. part. Right. But we don't want to abandon the other parts. Um, and I think that's what's sort of developing a little bit. You see more with uh, shoppable TV and these sort of in interactive experiences that everything starts a little bit rudimentary. And they're just almost like vignettes. And, they're, and you have buttons on the top. And it's kind of like leafing through a catalog or something. There's not a lot of depth to it. But I think what we're hoping for to see develop is now story-based, you know, rooting it in the elements of storytelling rooting it in the elements of storytelling and wrapping it in response strategy. Right, and I've got a couple of great examples of both of those things. So this is a tangible human experience that I had on Sunday. <laughs> Bonk. So this is uh, me watching the NCAA tournament, if you can see it on the, and this is uh, my, uh, my hard-working Pitt Panthers as they, as they <laughs> fell to Xavier. <laughs> Um, but that was, uh, I was watching that, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing Megan on Tuesday, here's her flow code, plunk. Um, and that's a, that's a tangible interactive experience on cable, live sports, mm -hmm. right? A really interesting moment for the user and the consumer to say, I'm gonna be, I'm curious about that. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest with you, I, hope, I don't know if anyone in the room created that banner ad. I'm not super much of a fan of the banner ad, because to Jack's point, there's no story about why I would go to that place, right? And I think that's what they're learning too, yeah. right? Yeah. How do you tell a story in three or four words on a banner to get someone to actually click on that QR code to have a more immersive experience? Um, on the flip side, here's an example of a very immersive experience. And Jack, I think it goes to what you talked about in terms of storytelling and how to create a story within that moment and still get response. So my good friend Peter, Oh, where'd that go, guys? Hello. I have, a, I have a question while you're doing that. Who decides on the on the placement of the banner? Is it the seller? Is it the brand? Is it Floco? Who, who is the network? I wish it was us. I, probably the network, I would imagine. Right. So while you were watching it, here's where I'll get spicy. While you were watching it, were you upset that you couldn't see the basket, whether it was made or not? No, because they, they timed it so that there was no one coming down the court. It was up there where it was kind of a shot of kind of, I don't watch a lot of basketball. I'm surprised at how often people just stand around. Um, so it was one of the moments when they were standing around. Um, so Peter, you're on it. You Bonk, there you go. You can see it. You can touch it, you can click on it, and it comes throughout the ad, these various pluses. Jack spotted this um, just a couple of hours ago, and Peter and Tom, thanks for being able to, to put that in play. Yeah. Um, but it's a wonderful moment, right, of blending story yeah. and commerce. I think it, it, I was so excited when I saw it because it's, it's, it's doing a lot of the things that we've, we, we're trying to do as a, as a creative agency in, in our advertising and in our television commercials that we make, which is, it contains, if you analyze it, it contains all the elements of story. It, it has identifiable characters, they're unique. 
It has authentic emotion. Something's happening to those characters. It contains a significant moment. So each transition between the scenes is a significant moment of that scene. And then, and then it uses specific details to tell that story, like the guy throwing the knife, the look on his face. It takes all those and it wraps it in what I was talking about, which is creative strategy. People know what the product is, why they need it, and where to get it. Where to get so, it. I thought, I, so I think this is a great example of hopefully where we go. We go away from flipping through uh, Perfect. images Perfect. that don't really have a lot of connection to us. And then it's a great experience. And what I love about this too is if, if, if he wants to, he, we just hit play again. Right, and we're back in the story. And watch it again. And, watch, and, yeah. and, what I, and what I like about this example is that it, it doesn't work on a big flat screen TV if you don't have a way to activate it. It works great if you're watching it on your phone and you can tap, or it works great on a laptop if you can click on it, right? So it is somewhat device dependent, and it gets into this place, Megan, where you talked about um, the, the ad technology, mm -hmm. right? And the, and the different devices of the ad technology. And you had mentioned in our comment about kind of the immersive versus fragmented experiences. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, um, you know, and I, I think about uh, early days of, of using uh, flow code for shoppable tech across different you know types of TV or, or different types of media and one of the things that was really interesting is that each of these ads could have been promoting the same product but ultimately um, you know depending on where you were whether you were walking past on a city street watching TV all of these different things you kind of were having this fragmented brand experience especially if you were scanning through multiple times right so you're not getting a cohesive message there's nothing super compelling about seeing the same ad across all of these things, unless we're just counting frequency. And we know that's only part of the story, right? And what we've seen now is a new kind of creative approach, and, and there's a direct correlation between um, you know, flow code scans and conversions and, and creative. If the creative doesn't resonate, people do not scan the code. So nobody's responding to the flow code, they're responding to the creative. And it, poses the opportunity to elaborate on that, right? Like, how do you expand that creative experience? And we're seeing people now who are doing things like incentivized frequency engagement, right? So, like, if you are running, you know, multiple uh, TV creatives and you want to incentivize somebody to engage with that ad in multiple environments, we actually have uh, people now using... Um, you know, scan to collect this new piece of exclusive content, right? And you can only get this piece on TV and then you get a, a complimenting piece in out of home and you get another complimenting piece if you engage on social. And so what you're creating is instead of, you know, leaning into frequency, leaning into just that kind of initial impression and leaving it up to the, the consumer to then kind of deepen that relationship, we're, we're seeing this direct marriage between that shopability part, that interactivity, and the creative. And you see it in things like exclusive video content or custom social media filters. Or, you know, even right now, one of my favorite things is to, to touch on what you were saying about purchasing product. You need to try it on, you need to touch it, you need to do all of these things. Product demonstrations via augmented reality. You know, my, my most favorite one is, you know, seeing automotive and you have. Chevy, who's you know running spot to promote a bunch of different lease specials, and now we have the ability to scan the code to see it in your driveway. And if you're the consumer and you're rewarded, really, with an experience, with something creative, every time you see that ad, wouldn't you engage with it? And, and the thing that's really incredible about it, too, is that when you do have the ability for that shoppable component, whether it's in, you know, scheduling a test drive, which I understand is something separate, but scheduling a test drive, trying on a sweater, trying on these new uh, sunglasses, seeing a living room set in your, in your, uh, in your home, um, you know, it's a, it's a whole different layer to kind of this, this aspect. And you see people who, who are taking that further action because that creative experience is getting the hooks in. And so I think we're, sorry, I think what you're really talking about is creating brand immersion so that there's brand affinity. There are some challenges with, with incentives across different platforms because people will want to know why they got this here but their friend didn't get it here. Or, but you can get past that stuff over time. It, on the point of the ad tech, it does, and this is part of where our company comes in, right? There's 
programmatic advertising gives you the promise of managing the frequency capping of, of ultimately, if the creative is there, you can theoretically sequen sequence it. So you can tell that story. Um, you can track somebody from the view that they had uh, streaming television all the way down through to the purchase they make, where, even if it's in a retail location. Uh, and so that, that's, that's the second piece of the re redefinition, right? It's, it's, it's not just one platform. It's starting the story there, but finishing it there. And, and um, you know, in my experience in the performance marketing business, there's still a lot of manual. Uh, tell me if that's wrong. Uh, it's still somewhat manual. And you know, get comfortable with tech, because it'll help you execute really, really quickly and really efficiently and very well. Because we have the audiences, and you have the creative de delivery capabilities. Uh, you'll see the real promise of of t-commerce. So um, with that, are there emerging platforms that you're seeing that create a more integrated experience for not just the consumer, but also the marketers and the brands so they can facilitate and manage this? I think Jack is probably better suited to answer a question about creative because, because a lot of it comes to us from third parties, but there are certainly clients that are experimenting with it. Mm -hmm. it's, ex it's an expense, right? And that's usually for, for bigger brand marketers that are trying to do something a little bit different, like an automotive Mm -hmm. company or something like mm -hmm. that. But uh, yeah, I'd be curious for your point of view. On yeah. It. T tell me that again. What, what so I guess the question would be from the creative side, you've got a lot of different impressions. You've got out of home, you've got display, mm -hmm. and you have opportunity for shoppable experiences in almost all of them. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a billboard. You don't want people driving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roadside, <laughs> we don't, generally don't do, don't, right, don't do generally that. Generally not. <laughs> so uh, from your perspective, how, how do you treat that creative differently? Or to your point earlier, Jack, what's the through line yeah. that is most important between all those experiences? Well, I think um, a little forethought and making sure that, like, I think you mentioned, like, brand integrity or brand immersion, I think is, again, like, what is really important is, is, is you know, finding the thread so that all of those different elements do have some sort of connection, mm -hmm. and so uh, I, I think I, I think I think gone are the days when you could just work in your little world like we used to a long time ago, just make TV commercials, and I really didn't care what anybody else was doing with the brand. I just wanted to make the coolest TV commercial and maybe win an award. Um, but I, I think you, you you can't do that anymore. You gotta right. you gotta be able to. Uh, prepare for all of those. And we don't do all those different channels, but we sure should keep an eye on it. We sure want to be involved to make in sure that. it's connected. Make so sure it's connected. In, in terms of full integration, I would think that that this promise of fully integrated, vertically integrated, shoppable TV might be best driven by a brand like Amazon, right? They have the technology, they have the streaming platform, they have the content. They, of course, they can sell product, they can fulfill on that. Tom, what do you think? Do you think that that's a possibility that they can be in the forefront of this? Well, yeah, Amazon's certainly shown that they can do a lot of things very well when it comes to retail, media in general, but that doesn't mean that others can't do it. All right, so if you think about the challenge of the Jennifer Aniston sweater, it's, well, who is selling the sweater? Are you selling a campaign, as NBC, are you selling a campaign to Macy's and Macy's is gonna deliver it? Maybe they will, maybe. Um, or if you're a performance marketer who tends to manage your specific products and you're fulfilling already, then maybe you just need to partner with somebody who can fulfill for you. Mm -hmm. right? And that promise is there. One of the things about streaming TV that's pretty cool, at least I worked at Roku for a number of years, is um, everybody who buys a Roku puts a credit card into there so they can buy the films or, or the movies or Disney Plus or what have you, right? So they have your credit card information. They could theoretically take care of it. Um, Roku happens to be a partner of ours, so if you want to execute on Roku, you could execute through the Adelphic platform, <laughs> as, it, as it turns out, and you could run a good campaign. But, but the, the point is, uh, in, uh, seriously though, Amazon is, you know, they're very good at what they do, but they're not the only ones that can do it, and mm -hmm. it just may take some creative partnerships uh, to, to compete with them, but that's right. uh, and, and to, to your point about subscription, I would think someone like Disney Plus could do that. Um, because you have to enter in your stuff to subscribe. They're all looking they have, at it. They have a little bit of merchandise yeah. I think they can sell. Um, but uh, I think that that would be interesting. In, but I don't know that they're that like coordinated. They may be someday. But, uh, <laughs> but you've, you'll, if you watch, if anybody here has Hulu, 
Um, Hulu has been at the forefront of interactive ads on television. They have pausable ads where you can pause. They have ad selectors where you can say, I want this ad experience. There's a lot of experimentation going on right now, and, and it, it sort of feeds into the idea of commerce on the television mm -hmm. set um, with those experiences. Um, from, a, from a content um, creator standpoint, if you look at, I'm a, I'm a golfer, so I watch the PGA Tour. In the last year and a half, they've spent a lot of time shrinking the screens and putting information on the other side. They run ads on there, they put codes in there. There's all sorts of interesting things they're, they're doing to keep the user immersed in the television experience, which tends to be leaned back, but giving them an option and opportunity to do something else. And, and we're used yeah. to that now. We're yeah. so used to having the screen on a website with a lot of information and processing lots mm -hmm. of information differently that our behaviors have changed every day um, and, and I guess, you know, Megan, I'll ask you, seeing the flow code come out and seeing user behavior around the flow code, what has surprised you about what consumers have done? I think that I was most surprised at how willing consumers were to shop using a QR code on TV. So, um, you know, one of the things about it is that, you know, we're not constantly in our own echo chamber. You know, we came out of the pandemic and I think everybody at, at Flowcode asked the question like, okay, was this a flash in the pan? You know, are we gonna see a decrease in, in the behaviors that people are taking with, uh, with codes? And it's actually been the exact opposite. And I think um, it's, it's the combination of seeing that, that real ubiquity and then almost seeing the, not almost, seeing the demand from the viewer to have those interactive moments and in content. When we have done research, you know, we recently just launched um, a, a new survey that we did nationwide, uh, reached about 7,000 households, and we basically asked the questions like, how do you think about QR on TV? Would you shop with QR on TV? Are you interested in QR and ad environments? And far and away, the single leading cause of not scanning a QR code on TV is bad creative. The response was, if I am not interested in that creative or it's irrelevant to me, I am not mm -hmm. going to scan that QR code. Conversely, if it is, if I'm interested in that, we like the QR code. We want to scan with it. It's just it. a vehicle. Exactly. Right? Everybody knows how to do it. And right. so I think that's very surprising. Um, other than that, you know, we work with really innovative partners, and I've seen a lot of very exciting items come out, you know, to speak to, to shoppable TV specifically. Um, I don't know if anybody in the room is a Yellowstone fan or an Emily in Paris fan. Those are the two big ones right now. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've seen Shop the Scenes with our partner Jill Martin, she's from the Today Show, comes from a long background of shoppable TV in the Today Show, you know, steals and deals. Um, so she, you know, uses flow code in show where you can actually scan to purchase furniture that's inspired by the Yellowstone set or scan to purchase somebody's hat, scan to purchase somebody's wedding ring. And yes, there is a fulfillment component there, but it's this whole new concept of, gee, I really did like Jennifer Aniston's sweater, or my local news person is wearing a great dress today and I wish I could wear that. It's, it's uh, we kind of tongue in cheek say, it's like the Shazam of product, right? And so we see a lot of these really cool creative applications. I wouldn't say that's surprising because, you know, obviously we have really amazing creative brains behind our partners who are, you know, crafting the message that's driving the response. But, um, you know, even as a flow coder, it's been really incredible to see the way people are leaning into it and, and to see the demand from consumers as well. So on the creative side, Jack, how do you then address and bake into the, the, the response action in that moment mm -hmm. using a code? Because if she said earlier, no one's responding to the flow code, they're responding to creative. The creative people yeah. always yeah. ask right. that question. I'm like, right. they're not, they're, they don't care about us. Right, right. <laughs> they right. care it's, about you. They, right. Yeah. And so how do you then approach knowing that your a creative approach is going to have this function into it? Yeah. Um, so integration is is key. So I think flow codes are, are are a good flow code is a good example. Like what if we're talking about adding that now to a spot? One of the things we want to just right off the bat do is make sure it's designed in. It's not just slapped on. You know, we create a design for that to sit so it has purpose and it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think that's, that's, that's one of the creative you know, approaches we, we keep in mind. The other thing is, uh, be, I think we all have to be a little bit aware, is, and I think we're gonna get bit a little bit, 
the cause you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. So I think, you know, we're talking about, we have to be careful not to interrupt the viewing process too much. So just because you can buy that through Disney or just because they all have the, they gotta be careful that they're not losing people. People That's don't right. like to be oversold to. They want to have products that are relevant to them mm -hmm. and purposeful. And when it gets too much, people will shut it down. And then you lose, every, everybody loses. <laughs> the streaming television world has dramatically changed the commercial landscape because the standard load in a one hour program on linear broadcast historically was 16 minutes of ads an hour and about two or three of those would go to performance marketing and about nine or 10 would be self-promotion and the rest would be brand marketers. Uh, with the advent of streaming, we're starting to see half those commercial loads, right? Six to eight minutes on the Roku channel, six to eight minutes on Hulu. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure with Disney and Netflix, I think they both announced that with their ad supported businesses, it's seven or eight minutes an hour, right? So it's a lot less. They're thinking, and what you're really keying in on here is the user experience. Mm -hmm. Performance marketers, the good ones, have always done a really nice job of expressing the need and offering the solution and selling the solution in the span of a 30 second, 60 second, half hour or one hour program, right? That fundamentally can't change, but, but the thing that does change is how do you do it on the different platforms that users are now engaged with, right? And what was once working for TV is still probably gonna work pretty well, but now that you have this technology capability, you're gonna, you've gotta tell the through line of the creative, but make sure that the experience in the mobile app is perfect for mobile, right? right. And the experience in TV is not a mobile experience. And we, we saw this with content consumption when video first became available on desktop and on mobile as well, right? It's not the same experience. You, you're probably not gonna sit and watch a two hour movie on YouTube on your desktop, but you'll watch a three minute video. Sure. Right? So the ad experience has to reflect the same kind of changes in the, con you know, the, in the content consumption experience. And I, I think that's, a, I just wanted to add something about sure. that because you, what you're hitting on is another thing that we're finding as creatives, and that is the tonality of the placement of our ad is changing or can change. So when you had a traditional linear commercial break like what you're talking about, it was a little bit anything goes in that break because people were used to it, having a variety, they knew they were coming and they knew they were going to get hit with, a whole, one ad might be emotional, one might be funny, one might just be simply a 10% off sale. They got everything. But when you sit down and you're watching, let's take a streaming platform, the tone of you sitting there in there watching is different yeah. than it is just kind of letting TV flow over the top of you. So we're aware of that. So we, we have to be careful. Like I'm not sure always ultra emotional spots play that well. It kind of shuts people like, I didn't really want to do that. I kind of want to watch Ted Lasso or something, right, you know what right, I mean? Right. Well, especially in a streaming environment where you can't always control things like frequency. You know, when you're looking at, it could be a great spot, but if I see it 20 times in the one binge session that I'm having with, you know, whatever show it is, 90 Day Fiance or whatever, uh, it doesn't matter whether I was in market for that car or not. All I know is that I don't want it anymore. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, there's a whole side to it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm kind of derailing just a smidge, but the really interesting part of these interactive moments, the shoppable moments, if we think of them like clicks, we have the opportunity to optimize in real time, even in mediums that traditionally have not been you know, optimizable in real time. If we think about broadcast TV, you know, you're running spot on broadcast TV and you have these shoppable creative experiences and all of this and they don't get a response. Or conversely, if they do, you know, how, how are you uh, being nimble and using, you know, uh, holding, I, I suppose I would say, there's a certain level of accountability and responsibility to that viewer and really understanding where they're responding, how they're responding, and why, and then adapting accordingly. And so much of the creative process is that. And now you get to add a little bit of the, the science to it too. And it's really an interesting tool for these users because it's taking the same principles, um, the data collection and the measurability of e-commerce and putting it behind all of these different platforms. You raise a great point, and I, I take the long view in that one a little bit because the promise of streaming TV, because it's delivered digitally, is ultimately that those, those frequency capping issues can go away mm -hmm. uh, when everybody's using the same kind of technology to deliver the signal, which is going to happen. It's already happening at a faster pace than most people thought it would. 
but it is a bit of a challenge right now because there are multiple resellers of, the, of these kinds of experiences. Um, it, it's it's going to get better. It's so, just not so, there yet. So with mm -hmm. that, to take the long view, and it's going to get better, um, the next generation of our bright young consumers are coming up. So Gen Z is going to be 30% of consumers uh, by 2025. Um, and uh, or actually, the, the largest consumer group by 2025, and 30% of, of employees, right, in a couple of years, which is crazy. Um, but we all know that they're digital natives. Generation Alpha coming after Generation Z is very much digital natives, where they will never have grown up without a smartphone. And I guess I'll toss this to all three of you, and I, I guess we'll go Jack, Meg, and Tom. Um, with the long view, with the promise of some of these new technologies, we've talked about some of the changing consumer behaviors. Mm -hmm. How does this play out for Generation Z in that next, gen in that next pocket of consumers? So, well, so creatively speaking, uh, from a creative standpoint, we know that that generation, that generation knows it's being tracked and they know they're being sold mm -hmm. too. They just decide how much they let you in. And so, um, I think what that means for us is the only real way in is authenticity. Yeah. So they can smell it, and they're used to being tracked and being sold to. So I think the work that we have to do has to have some authenticity to it and relevancy to them. So I don't think we can fake that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that just brings us back to some of the things that have worked forever, and that is you know, tangible human experiences that we apply, we, we use to describe the products and services that we want to promote. Mm -hmm. Megan, what do you think? How are you guys planning for this next generation of shoppers at Slow Code? Well, I'll tell you, it goes beyond the QR code. So a lot of what we're seeing now is, is very NFC based. You see this level of interactivity and, and connection that's happening with, with these younger audiences who, um, to your point, are used to consuming digital content, used to uh, you know connecting with friends socially, used to having these kind of uh, you know to your point kind of tight circles of who am I sharing my data with, how am I connecting with people, and it's all very direct and very um, you know intentional. I suppose is is how I see a lot of the actions you know in this space, and so. You know, you're going to see things from us that are going to go beyond just that QR scan. How is it, you know, can you get to a point where you're waving your phone over an out-of-home ad? Is, mm -hmm. Are you getting to a point where there's a haptic sound that pops up with your, with your TV ad that launches a mobile experience? You know, as the expectation for these experiences grow and as we see not only leaning into them in media, you know, obviously this, this demographic uh, gen... This, yeah, Gen Z. This I'm, my my younger sister is a, is part of this group, and so I often I'm like thinking of her, and I'm like, what what generation are you? Who are you? Um, because I was joking earlier that we're so drastically different, right? And so, um, you know, for her, it's it's second nature to buy something off of Instagram. It's second nature to watch a live stream on TikTok and purchase product from a live TikTok stream using PayPal via TikTok's interface. And like, this is something that I, like, I never would have, would have thought, but we see it happening in every single area of media consumption that they're, they're engaging with. And I'll tell you this too, you see it in real life. So like, for example, you know, we, we take this idea of shoppable TV, shoppable media, and you extrapolate it out to like, okay, what about real world? We have, um, you know, pop stars. So there's a global pop star who, speaking of TikTok, became very famous on, on TikTok. And she uses Flow Code, um, you know, in stadium on her tours to do everything from sell merch to sign up for ticket alerts to join our fan club to, you know, scan to engage in, with us on social, try our social media filter. There are so many different moments. Each of them has a data capability. There's a shoppable moment in a lot of these. There's a loyalty moment in a lot of these. And those are our strongest engaging, or those like against this demographic of like, I would say younger than 35. These are the areas that we see this really strong engagement. It's not just TV. It's not just shopping and social. It's also expecting that everywhere they go and, and seeing that the brands that they subscribe to are really leaning into it too. 
and offering it. So it's a technology platform. We'll, we'll integrate with any supply source of medium that comes around. That's, that's not the challenge for us. I'm, I'm really enjoying what I just heard from Michi because I think the authenticity point is, is accurate to a degree. But then I see these people buying from these totally inauthentic TikTokers. Uh, who, are, who are transparently trying to sell something. So I think there's a selective authenticity there mm -hmm. that comes in the consumer, and that just makes it even more challenging for everybody, right? So you, you, know, you have to be very above board, and they're gonna choose when they wanna be authentic or not, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they're, they're, they're kids. <laughs> That's what kids yeah. do. Yeah. To see your sister probably does that, my kids do that, everyone does that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I still choose to believe that Every medium has value in this chain somewhere. There will always be somebody that just, you know, I don't care how old you are, you're just gonna wanna plop on the couch and watch your TV and veg out for a little bit. And then there's gonna be times when you're highly engaged with what's going on on your phone and sometimes you're gonna do it together. Right? And so this is the challenge and the opportunity for us is to figure out how to bridge those things. But the authenticity piece is extremely interesting because it is very selective. Yeah, I mean, well, the there's always been the low hanging fruit. Yeah. There's always been that. So in, 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 you saw it a lot in, in early DRTV. You know, there was just, um, there was always, you know, there was the, the, the ones that would just fall first. And so you do get that people buying stuff off very, not very authentic. authentic. But I think you, if you want to go, if you want to have some longevity with your brand or product more than just a, a short life cycle. I think you probably do have to develop something a little bit deeper after all of the apples have been picked from the first branch. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think that what we know about the studies from this generation too is that they're looking for not a trans, more than a transaction. They're looking mm -hmm. for a relationship with the brands that they choose, right? And, and how these brands help define who they are and who mm -hmm. they're not. Right, so it's gonna, I think, be, be very interesting. And we are running out of a little bit of time to get to, that we got about five can, more can minutes. Can I just make one, one more point on it? Because right. the, the, the concept of branding has changed a little bit with influencers because, and the internet as a whole, right? Because you, you can look at something and figure out, this is interesting to me, but I don't have the brand equity in because I haven't been watching it on TV for 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. So now you do the research. What are other people saying about it? Right? What are the, re the customer reviews? And that's how you build some sort of sense of brand around mm -hmm. these products you see now, which is also a more challenging. But it's probably something that people here have to think about, is how do I, how do I build up the review value? And that goes back to the quality of the product and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is, we've got a couple minutes, and I wanted to touch on one thing that we didn't talk about. But before the session, Tom, you'd mentioned um, that your boys were into gaming. Yeah. And that G commerce is now this emerging space. G game commerce is this emerging space where I would imagine that would be a fast track to this shoppable TV moment because in in game experience I can buy stuff. Absolutely. So are are you? Is they're, that they're spending. They're spending. So they have PS4. Okay. Uh, they they get the. I went with my son to GameStop this weekend. Bought a. He bought a gift card with money that he earned his allowance uh, and he, he, I'm like what are you gonna buy with that he's like I'll buy upgrades and things like that at Viant we're talking a lot with the, the game manufacturers because there's now in-game advertising and it's dynamic mm -hmm. you can serve an ad into an experience now does a brand want to be associated with you know a shoot 'em up game you know where there's an ad on the wall for something that is being shot at by your first party <laughs> first first person shooter game maybe not but I'll leave that to them to decide. But the promise is there for sure. You can click on that ad, you can go into a different experience and you can use your PS4 bucks to buy that. Yeah, and I think of the integration and I went, to, I used Disney Plus, I'll use them again. Um, but uh, in the Fortnite platform, now there's a, they have the Marvel characters and they've got Star Wars. There's a whole opportunity for relatively PG rated games to expose you know, folks to merchandise to be able and have that conduit of purchase. So I think that might be interesting yeah. too. It's well, another it's medium. It's just another, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's in the experience. It's, it's something that you have to think about for yeah. sure. Speak of omni-channel, you can put flow codes on that. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, there's it's billboards in a, in a it, game. It's, it's not the same game. as IRL roadside. Go crazy, right, you know, right, right. Grand Theft Auto, you can have your billboards with uh, 
<laughs> codes in them. And like the cool thing, again, with the measurement aspect, instead of saying, oh, well, I got, you know, I'm trying to figure out my leads from this game and my leads from my shoppable TV and my leads from my shoppable CTV, when you have that unifying technology of a flow code in your e-com platform, it just makes it a lot easier to understand like shopping across that whole product set or across that whole message. Yeah, um, yeah it's an interesting kind of new, new thing to yeah, see. Yeah. The outcome yeah. analysis is also the important thing. I know we're out of time, but th this is something that uh, as, as, as digital buyers of inventory acting on behalf of advertisers, uh, they're all very interested in the reporting and making sure that their money was well spent. And that is a promise of something you know, that we're, you know, that's obviously delivered by new technology as well. And, it, and as you talk about redefining TV and connecting it to these other platforms, both creatively and from an execution standpoint, right. it's, it's critical to the success, obviously. That's right. Yeah. It's not a, it's, you're not just counting people calling up. And, uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's different. That is true. Are we good? Excellent. Uh, thank you for the, to this group uh, very quickly. Um, we also have about five, ten minutes for any questions you guys might have from the group. Uh, if there's any questions out there to ask, now is your chance. All right. I love that song. <laughs> Did you say I love that song? <laughs> um, my question is for Megan. Um, we, I work at Viant. Hey, Tom. Um, we get a lot of questions from clients that are like, what's new in the CTV space? Like, can we test QR codes and all that stuff? We run those campaigns. They perform sometimes, yeah. right? And you say creative, creative, creative a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm curious just for flow code specifically, what type of conversion and engagement rates are you seeing? Yeah, so what I will say, uh, so yeah, like anything, you look at a scan through rate, like a click through rate, lots of variables. Mm -hmm. um, what we are finding is that CTV is probably, and like hopefully no flow coders are gonna slap my hand about this, but CTV is probably our lowest scan volume area. And we do t chalk that up a lot to things like frequency, you know, so like if I, if, if a brand is delivering me 25,000 impressions and I scan on the first 100, like, you know, I, like, what are the rest of those for? You know, you're diluting the scan volume looking at it against your, against your impressions, but the problem is not, you know, it's, it's that you over-delivered to me. So there's that. We, we often see that. Um, you know, it's also... Uh, not as many people are as engaged with CTV uh, commercial ad pods as we have seen in like the broadcast space, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's just a, a lot of variables that kind of go into like how many times is that person seeing that code? Are they interested in the ad itself? Is the targeting there? And then, you know, you often, I, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of all of the reasons why I have issues with CTV these days. But what I will say is that conversion rates universally with CTV are obnoxiously high. Like if we are looking at like a scan to purchase, 25%. So if you're looking at this, I often will talk about scans in the CTV space as an indicator of success. Rather than saying like all of your leads are gonna come from that CTV, I often will say, okay, well what data did you collect from that person? Can we create a lookalike audience? Can we map this back geographically to something that makes a lot of sense for you? And you know, CTV is another really great way to kind of A-B test creative as well. If you're getting ready to launch it nationally, if you're getting ready to launch on broadcast, um, we often see, you know, using flow codes to test in a CTV environment often lends itself really well to, to success in other mediums. So um, definitely a positive one. Scan volume a little bit lower, but, you know, the, the data and the conversion on the back end is, is universally so, high. So, so still a smaller positive. percentage click, but a greater percentage of purchase? Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess we could say, like, a, uh, the exposed audience, uh, it, we still have questions about exposure, but when that <laughs> user does scan, uh, the likelihood of conversion is incredibly high. So, yeah. It, does it have anything to do with the fact that TV viewers are more likely to be real? How do you mean? Uh, do you mean in uh, not, linear not, versus not CTV? Fraud, not digital fraud. Yeah, so, well, I mean, that's, that's definitely the big question. And again, like, I don't, 
the reason that I bring up these, these things like frequency and all of this with CTV is that we see so many of our partners. We work with like 85% of the Fortune 500. There's this huge shift to, you know, these fast networks. How do, we, how do we get all of our dollars into this really targeted space? And then you see issues with things like frequency. You see issues with things like fraud. And we have users who are saying, hey, I, I thought I was running CTV and it served into a banner ad, right? And so we're having these conversations with these partners now, playing a role where I think we thought we were gonna be shoppable TV and now we're more in the attribution space, specifically for that reason. So like, when we look at things like broadcast, it's a, or like, you know, NCAA, the Super Bowl, anything that, that is a little bit more live and high volume, um, we still see really high conversion rates, big scan rates, big conversion rates, all of this. Uh, not quite as high as CTV. I do feel that it is a much more, um, what we are seeing is that the impact of creative messaging on the big screen in the household, that's never going in. Like, uh, like I am more convinced of the power of TV today than I was when I was working in broadcast, when I was working in TV. Um, and so yes, I think, I think the TV audience, when it is, a real audience, we're proving that that is super quality. The CTV portion of it does, when it's fraud, it's, when fraud is in the mix. It sort of shows you have to find a trusted partner. You know, I mean, that's, that's really it. Good trusted attribution partner, trusted distribution partner, I mean. Is that data that you were talking about, is that with the advertiser, like the brand themselves, and then they get to choose how they use that data? Um, data meaning like, like user data that's collected. Yeah. Yeah, so a uh, couple of things. We do have, um, so on the flow code side, uh, we're collecting, uh, we can collect certain things like geographic data, like GPS related data. We do have a first party conversion pixel, so we're able to see uh, shopping behaviors and things like this. Um, but we also, what a lot of our partners do is actually use the back end of our platform, our, our landing page platform, um, it's compatible with you know, various CRM systems and e-commerce systems and all of this. And so what they're doing is marrying the data that we're capturing that they don't necessarily have access to um, and then kind of combining it with that first party data that they're capturing in our platform. It all gets piped into their systems via API. Uh, and it tells a really interesting story, especially considering our codes live in every creative environment. So instead of looking at this like, oh, here are my linear results, here are my streaming results, and most of that credit's gonna go to Google anyway, mm -hmm. you now have all of your, your data kind of segmented out and you can look at that campaign overall instead of just by silo. So it's a really interesting thing, but very collaborative between two systems. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Or do we all just want to get to the drinks? All right. Thank you again to this great group. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you.